Well, how we thank the Lord our God for his presence and his spirit in this place and the opportunity we have to be guided and governed by his spirit and by his word and fellowship that we share in faith with one body of Christ Jesus. Today, as we prepare to hear word from the Lord, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles. If you open your Bible right to the middle, if you got a good Bible, that should be the book of Psalms. Uh, if it's a bad Bible, it may land anywhere else, but if it's a good Bible, the middle should be the book of Psalms. I want to invite you to the 116th Psalm as we hear a good question that deserves a good answer. In the 116th Psalm, the psalm writer asks a good question that prayerfully we will develop a good answer for this morning. If you're able, won't you stand as you find the 116th Psalm and we begin our journey in verse number 12 this morning. The 116th Psalm in verse number 12 reading this morning out of the New King James Version of God's Holy Word. The 12th verse, the 116th Psalm says, what shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits unto me? I will take up the cup of salvation. I will call on the name of the Lord and I will pay my vow to the Lord now in the presence of his people. It's a good question in that 12th verse. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits unto me? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord today. Just want to seek very quickly to answer the question, how can I say thanks? This upcoming week, I will travel again to a conference where I've been honored to lecture in front of other pastors and seminarians who are growing in their calling and their pastorship. And inevitably, as was last year the case, whenever I'm called LeVar to lecture and preach with other preachers and pastors and seminarians, I gather in a place where the word goes out about the great work that God is doing in Alfred Street Baptist Church. They hear about the multiple ministries. The testimony is given of how we have grown from where we were to where we are. They hear of the financial stability of which God has granted us as a church family and how favored we are in this DMV area. And inevitably, Dr. Gunn, the question is asked, Pastor, what is the key to growing a church? Young seminarians, pastors gather and they figure that I must have some formula that you can apply across the board that helps you grow a church. Some of them say it, it has to be preaching, and I say, well, that, that's part of it, but, but I know pastors who can preach and ain't nobody showing up. They say, well, it must be you know, the ability to have all these active ministries. I said, yes, but if you don't have the people, the ministry means nothing. And so they always ask, well, is it the administrative ability? Is it your ability to cast vision? I said, no, I can't really credit that. I've got a good team around me who helps me see what I don't see. And so inevitably they wonder, well, Pastor, what, what do you attribute as the key to growing a church, being successful in the kingdom of God? And I finally figured it out, my brothers and my sisters. The, the answer is very easy. The answer that I share now repeatedly is that you really have to learn to love God's people. You have to be willing to come out early and shake hands before worship. You've got to see people in the hallway and stop and talk to them like they really matter. You've got to pick up the phone on people's birthdays and shock them by just calling to sing happy birthday to them. <laughs> A young man that I was having this conversation with Kind of got it twisted. He came to me and said, so you got to learn to love the sheep. I said, no, the goats. Because you see, the sheep are easy to love. But church and just made up of sheep. There's some goats among us. And goats... 
are harder to love. Jesus put it like this, anybody can love the lovable. There's no credit in that. Can you love those that are difficult? And my brother and sister, I would suggest to you that if you would be successful in anything in life, you've got to learn how to love sheep and goats. And Dr. Dunn, I'm getting, I'm getting better at it. I'm, I'm learning to love all difficult types of people. I'm learning to operate in the midst of people who are easygoing and those who are high strung, those who are flexible, those that are type one, personalities. But I'll be honest, th th there's a group of church folk that I have issue with. There are group of people in life that I don't work well with. There's some people I, I just don't get along with well. And that would be, Patrice, I have issue with folk that are always taking and never giving. Yeah. It's difficult for me to deal with people who always expect something but never want to give anything. People who always have a hand out, but never want to give you a hand to help you out. You know the people who have no shame calling on you to do anything for them, but they can't do nothing for you. You, you, you know the type of folk I'm talking about. They come to a potluck and don't bring a dish. <laughs> you, you know them. They'll ask you to drive them all over town and won't volunteer to put $5 in your gas tank. People will always expect you to be on call for them, but when you need them, they're nowhere to be found. I have issues with takers and users, and that's a real word, because we have become a generation that is proficient in taking. That we always want to get, but never want to give. As a matter of fact, you see them coming to church, and you hear them when people walk out and have the audacity to say, I didn't get anything out of worship today. They come into church and they look at the bulletin. If their choir's not singing, they ain't getting nothing. If their preacher isn't preaching, they're turning around and leave. <laughs> Touch the name and say, don't do that, don't do that. Because, my brother and sister, you will miss the essence and the beauty of worship, if the only question on your mind is what am I going to get out of this? That worship primarily is not about you getting your blessing and getting your breakthrough and getting your word and getting your revelation and getting your song and getting your sermon. No, worship is not about what you get but rather it is about what you will give back unto God for the God that has brought you through the week that you've just come through. Can I preach that right there? That worship at its best is not a congregation of folk who are looking to receive, but those who walk in the house of God declaring that God has been so good to me. God has blessed me so much. God has done so many wonderful things that when I enter the house of God, my question is not who's singing. My question is not who's preaching. My question is not whether I'm in overflow or the sanctuary. My question is what can I give to God in thanksgiving for all that the Lord has done? done for me. That, that, that's where the psalmist lands in Psalm 116. Psalm 116 is part of a collection called the Hallel Psalms. Between Psalm 113 and 117, you will see that each one of those Psalms, 113, 14, 15, 16, and 17, they all end with the same phrase. Your Bible says, praise the Lord, but in Hebrew, it's the phrase, hallelujah. And therefore, these psalms are called the hallel psalms because they end with the psalmist saying, praise the Lord. Now, you must wonder why the psalmist is saying, praise the Lord. Because these psalms, between 113 and 117, are the psalms that Israel would read and sing during the season of Passover, which had some saints that remember what Passover is. Passover is when the people of God in the promised land paused, hit rewind and play, and recalled everything that the Lord had done to bring them out of Egypt. It was a time of reflection of how the Lord brought them out of the hand of Pharaoh, took them to the Red Sea, 
and made a way out of no way. And how the Lord conquered their enemies on their backside. How the Lord then guided them through the wilderness with clouds and fire. And how when they were hungry, the Lord rained down manna from on heaven. And how the Lord protected them when the scorpions and the serpents tried to bite them. How the Lord shielded them from the enemies that tried to destroy them. How the Lord brought them to Jericho and made the walls come tumbling down. And how the Lord brought them into a land flowing with milk and honey. And when they thought about what the Lord had done, they had no choice but to say hallelujah. That whenever your memory takes a walk down memory lane and you remind yourself of the ways the Lord has made and the doors the Lord has opened and the protection God has given and the manna God fed you with and the direction that God gave you and the discernment that God gave you, there ought to be just one somebody who involuntarily says hallelujah because God's been good to me. Boy, can I preach this thing? The psalmist in 116 is, he's walking down memory lane. And as he walks down memory lane, he says, you know what? There are some benefits to walking with God. And I would tell you today that you know if you're looking for a job, it's not just the base salary you evaluate. But you need a job with some. Matter of fact, there's a sister here who can say amen because you need a brother that's got a job with some. I need something else you bring to the table. And so watch, the psalmist declares that, that when you walk with God, there are some benefits that come from this relationship. He says the first benefit you find in verse number one, the first benefit is that God answers prayer. This, this is what I found out. When you call on the name of the Lord, he will answer you. And, and now, now, that's a benefit. Some of you may miss it because you, you're holier than I am. And, and you've been saved since you were six. And you've been talking in tongues all your life. And you got it all together. But there's some of us who know that a God who answers prayer is a benefit. C can I tell you why? A few reasons. Because there have been some situations when life was so rough, you didn't even know what you should have been praying for. C come here. H have you ever found yourself so twisted and confused that when you bowed down, you didn't even know where to start? You didn't know what to ask God to do? You didn't even know where God should begin? You just knelt down. And all you could say was, Lord, have your way. And as a witness that when you didn't know what to pray, God answered a prayer you didn't even know you were praying, and God blessed you with something you didn't even ask for. Have you ever seen God give you what you didn't ask for and do what you didn't ask him to do and open a door you didn't even know was there? Because he answered prayer. Somebody holler, that's a benefit. Can I push it? Not, not, not only does he answer prayer, you didn't even know what to ask. Watch this. There have been some times when you knelt down in prayer, and the truth be told, um, you were praying for the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This is everybody, but can you pause and look back at your prayer from 84? <laughs> and you know back then what you were asking God for now in 2014, you can thank God that he didn't give you what you asked for. This isn't for everybody, but somebody can praise God that his answer was no. Thank God he didn't put you in that relationship. Thank God that one didn't make it to the altar. Thank God you didn't get that job. Thank God you didn't walk down that road. Thank God he answered you with a no. Can I push it? It's a benefit because I didn't always know what to pray. It's a benefit because sometimes I pray for the wrong thing. And it's a benefit, number three, watch this, because there's sometimes 
I had to pray a prayer I should not have had to pray. Janice, they didn't even get it. I've had to pray some stuff that I shouldn't have had to pray. And I had to ask God to do some things that God shouldn't have had to do if I hadn't done what I did. You, 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 you ever start your prayer in honest confession and shame? Lord, I'm so sorry I got to ask you to do this. But God, I need you to get me out of what I got myself in. I need you to shield me from what ought to be coming my... I need that test to be negative, God. I beg you by the blood of Jesus. Y'all are so holy. Somebody knows you are thankful that God did what God should not have had to do. But because you prayed, the Lord answered and protected you and shielded you and let it be negative. And I thank God that he answers prayer. Somebody say that's a benefit. That's not all he does. Not only does he answer prayer, the psalmist understands in verse number seven that he goes above my petition. That the Lord, he says in verse number seven, has dealt abundantly with me. That, that he didn't just do the bare minimum. God doesn't just skate by. When's the last time God got a C minus for blessing you? No, here's what the writer Paul says. The God we serve is so good. Watch this Bible readers. He goes exceedingly <laughs> and abundantly, watch, watch, above all that we could ask. That whatever I ask God for, God says you ain't even close to what I really want to do in your life. But because you ask, I'm going to show you how good I, I need a witness. Is anybody here that asked God for a little and he gave you a lot? You asked for just enough and he gave you in abundance? You wanted just a little more time and he gave you an abundance of time because he goes exceedingly, abundantly, above what we ask to think. Somebody say that's a benefit. And he ain't done yet. He answers prayer. He goes above my petition. But watch this, number three, in verse number five, the psalmist declares, here's another benefit. God has accepted me with patience. He says, verse number five, the Lord has been merciful unto me. Now, let me tell you, you, you really don't understand mercy until you've messed up. So here's what the psalmist says, listen, I know I'm in church, I know it's Sunday, but I got to be honest, I've messed up, and the Lord has been merciful. I have fallen short, and the Lord gave me another chance. I did not live right, and the Lord forgave my sins. I didn't do right, and the Lord still allowed me to wake up the next morning. And there are a couple folk in here that are the recipients of mercy. Can I push it? Let me tell you what the Bible says in verse 5. The Lord preserves the simple. I've got to say for everybody. You, you, you know what a 2014 translation of simple is? Stupid. <laughs> Here's what the psalmist says. I did some stupid things. And the Lord still preserved me. Now, now, I know I know there's some holy folk and intelligent folk and people in here, you, you've only made some minor mistakes in your life. Huh? But there are a couple of us that know our resume is marked with some moments of stupidity and utter insanity uh, that, that really done, well, you've done some things that didn't even make sense to yourself. Okay, okay, y'all too young. 
I, I, I'm, I'm called a seasoned saint. So I need a couple seasoned saints. You, you about 85, 90, but your memory's still good. And you look back at when you were 25, and you know you were stuck on stupid, and you did some things that didn't make any sense to where you are now. But you're here today because in spite of my stupidity, God had his hand on me, and God preserved me, and God was Are there any folk that know you've been stupid, but God was still sovereign? You were crazy, but God was still in control. You lost your mind, but God didn't let you go. Would you touch somebody tell him he preaching to me now? He preaching to me. He answers prayer, goes above my petition. He's accepted me with patience. And then finally, in verse number eight, the, the psalmist testifies, and the Lord is always protecting me. Look what he says. He delivered me from Sheol. It's verse number eight. Sheol is the place of death. It's a place where I should have been buried. Sheol in Hebrew is synonymous with Gehenna. It is the word for hell. That in hellified places where I should have died, the Lord brought me out of it. That I've been in some situations where I should have lost it all, but God. I could have been crazy, but God. I could have been locked up, but God. Might have been strung out, but for God having his protective hand on me, I am what I am because the Lord has brought me out. I just need to take a real Gallup poll real quick. Anybody ever been in a living hell? No, 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 I ain't talking about you super sanctified. I'm, I'm, I'm in the folk that know you've been in some hellified places with some hellified people in some hellified situations, and in spite of what should have happened and how you could have died and given up, the Lord still delivered you out of something you never thought you could get out of. Oh, God. So here's what the psalmist says. When I think about a God who answers prayer, a God who goes above my petition, a God who accepts me with patience, a God who's always been protecting me. This is what he says. What shall I render to that God? Don't miss the train of thought. I've been reflecting over the goodness of God, and here's where I've landed. God's been too good to me to do nothing. God's brought me too far to just sit in church and wonder what I'm going to get. God has opened up too many doors for me to just sit like a bump on a log and act like God ought to be happy that I'm in church. That when I think of what the Lord has done, something inside of me wonders, what can I do for that God? Marcia, it has to be this psalm that was the inspiration of Brother Andre Crouch's famous hymn, How Can I Say Thanks for the Things You've Done for Me? Things so undeserved, yet you did to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. And all that I am and ever hope to be I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the things he has done. What shall I give to God? How do I say thank you? Well, the psalmist gives three good Baptist answers, and I dropped them on you. We're going home. He says, number one, I will take the cup of salvation. So when I think about how good God has been, the first thing I'm going to do is take the cup of salvation. Paul, pause, pause. There's a problem here. Pastor, you said that we ought to come wondering what we give to God. And the psalmist's first answer is what I'm going to take from God. Chris, they missed it. Let me rewind. When I think about how good God has been, my first instinct is to take the cup of salvation. You, you, you don't catch it yet. I'm supposed to be giving something 
And the psalmist says that what you ought to give is by taking. Take the cup of salvation. Accept the offer that God has put on the table. Drink from the cup of the forgiveness of sins. Allow him to dwell in relationship with you. Receive his offer of eternal life. Surrender your soul to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Accept the offer of salvation that God is bringing to you. You know, it's like in the day in which this was written, it was offensive for you to go to someone's home and they had prepared a meal for you and you not eat what they offered you. That if they were offering something, the greatest form of thanksgiving would be to receive what they have sacrificially prepared for you. When we go overseas and I take our ministers with us and our young interns, I remind them we're going to impoverished areas. We're going to areas that they don't have a lot. But one thing they have is a lot of dignity and respect. And when they know that they have a guest coming to their home, watch this, they are going to prepare for you the best meal they can. Now, what they offer you may not be some cowboy ribeye from Morton's Steakhouse. They may fix for you something that doesn't look that great to you. But they sacrificially prepared it and don't be rude and sit down and not receive what they have sacrificially prepared for you. That when someone has made a sacrifice for you, you ought to have enough good sense to accept what they're offering you. Can I tell you about the cup of salvation? That in order to offer it to you, God in the fullness of time, had to descend unto the earth and put on the flesh of Jesus Christ and allow himself to be crucified so that a cup of salvation could be put in your midst. And one of the ways I say thank you to God is to receive that offer of forgiveness of sins, to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior to accept the relationship God has for me through Jesus, my Lord. He says, I'm going to take the cup of salvation. Now, somebody said, well, Reverend, you know what? I did that a long time ago. I got saved in kindergarten. <laughs> I received Jesus Christ. I was baptized at seven, filled with the Holy Ghost at seven and a half. <laughs> and so I've got that part. Well, well, you're not done yet. Because if you read the New International Translation, it doesn't just say, I will take the cup. Another version, Andrea says, I will lift up the cup. So, so what God requires in Thanksgiving is not just me receiving the salvation, but it's lifting it up. Now, in biblical terminology, when you lift something up, you're making it presentable for all others to see. Don't miss it now. So the psalmist says, when I think about how good God has been, when I think about God that answers prayer, goes above my petition, a God that accepts me with patience, a God that's always protecting me, I will not only receive his offer, but I'm going to lift it high so that everyone around me knows that I am saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I am a born-again, sold-out, blood-washed Christian. I have given my life to Jesus Christ, and I am not ashamed for the whole Whole world to know that he is my Lord and my Savior. I lift high my forgiveness of sins. He says, I'm going public with my faith. Let me say something. You are not grateful if your salvation is your best kept secret. You're not grateful if you walk in circles and they don't have a clue to how important Jesus is to you. You're not thankful 
If you sit in the midst of people and they feel they can talk anywhere about you, around you, drink anything around you, talk in any kind of vulgarity, insult the name of Jesus Christ, and you sit silent, no brother, man, sister, girl, there comes a point in your life when God has been so good to you that you lift high your salvation and you want the world to know I am blood bought in Jesus' name and there's some things you can't say around me, there's some jokes you can't cry in my presence there's some things you cannot offer me because I am not ashamed to live high that I am washed in the blood of the lamb touch somebody tell them I'm going public listen listen everybody else is coming out the closet If there's one thing you ought to be proud of and share with the world is the fact that you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the price for your sins and on the third day he was resurrected by the power of God and I believe that with my heart and I confess it with my mouth that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father and I am not ashamed to go public with my faith. So I'm going to take a cup of salvation. I'm going to lift it up. And then watch thoroughly the psalm. It says, I'm so grateful that I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. Let me, let me cut across the field and make this quick. He says, I'm going to pray to God. That one of the ways I express my gratitude for God's goodness is to call on his name. Now, what's amazing about this, if you remember verse number one, the psalmist has already testified about calling on the name of the Lord. Amber, he's already said that if I call on God, God will answer. So here's what he says, and I'm so grateful that he answered when I called that I'm going to call again. And when he answers that, I'm going to be so grateful that he answered that I'm going to call again. And when he answers that call, I'm so grateful that he answered that I'm going to call again. Some of y'all suck on slow. And when he answers that call, I'm going to be so grateful that I call again. That one of the ways I show my gratitude to the Lord is I continuously call on the name of the Lord because I found out what prayer can really do. Yeah. That when I pray, God answers. Now that's a word because so many people in life, Dean Stafford, they talk about prayer like it's some kind of experimental drug with no proven results. You, you ever heard saints talk like this? Well, I guess all I can do is pray. You, you talk about prayer like you don't know what prayer can do. Because when you've truly prayed and called on the name of the Lord, you have found out that prayer will change things. Prayer will turn some things around. Prayer will bring some children back in their right mind. Prayer will cast some disease out of your body. Prayer will open some doors for economic advancement in your life. Prayer will edit some enemies out of your world. Prayer will give you strength to endure the storms of life when you pray. One of the reasons God is so pleased when we pray it's because what you're saying when you pray is that, God, I'm making you my first choice, not my last option. Yeah. Yeah. That I'm not going to try to handle this by myself. I'm going to pray. I ain't calling on Lisa and Lulu. I'm going to pray. I'm not giving this to my brothers. I'm going to pray. I'm not checking my bank account. I'm going to pray. I'm not trying to win friends. I'm going to pray. I'm not trying to get in good with this circle of that. I'm going to pray. And I trust that after I pray, my God will handle this better than any other alternative I have for my situation. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, let me help you. Um, Faye, when I first came into Alpha Street, um, one of the things I learned is that we don't just give business to anybody. Uh, when we have contracts and um, RFPs that go out, um, we require a three-bid system uh, that says that we need at least three people to bid on any project before we award a contract. And I thought that was good business, because that way, you know, you make people become competitive. You want to make certain that you don't just favor anybody, that there's a fair process. And so I, I decided to use that in my personal life. Um, I have a bid system um, 
especially for work in my home. I, I have a bid system because, you know, I don't want to be cheated. And when, I, when I've got work that needs to be done, some remodeling, when I've got painting, whenever I've got to do what has to be done, I put out a bid system. Now, uh, typically the bid system I've chosen, this brother named Julio. I've landed with a brother named Julio. Uh, Julio, yeah, Julio get the work done. Julio, he ain't like us. Hey, hey. Hey, hey, Julio and them, they show up on time. They don't talk while they work. They eat lunch and work at the same time. And Julio and them, they get the job done. And, and I've, I've liked Julio. Julio has painted for me. Julio has remodeled the home. Julio has revamped some things. He's done a lot of work in my house. So the other day, I had to get some more painting done. And I called Julio, I said, listen, listen, I, I need you to put in a bid for this painting. Um, I'm going to have two other painters come, and I just want them all to bid, and I want to see if your price will be competitive. And this is what Julio said to me. He said, Evan, <laughs> so Reverend, he said, how many times have I come through for you? How many times have I showed up on time? How many times have I gotten the job done? Why do you keep putting me in competition when I've already proven that I can get the job done? And God is asking someone this morning, how many times do I have to come through for you to just learn to call on me and trust me to handle your situation? Somebody say, I'm going to call on God. I said, listen, listen. I got, I got to leave you. I got to leave you. It's time to go. We got to go. got to go. He says, he says, when I know that God has answered prayer, gone above my petition, that he's accepting me with patience, that he's always been protecting me, he says, I'm going to take up the cup of salvation. I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. And then finally he says, and I will pay my vow to the Lord now in the presence of his people. You see that right there, verse number 14? It's in your Bible unless you took it out. He says that, that I will pay my vow to the Lord. Now, a vow is a promise that has been made. So the psalmist is arguing, is that listen, before I got in what I got in, I made a promise to God that if he answered my prayer, I would do something. I promised the Lord that, that if he went above my petition, I would do something. That when I think about what the Lord has done, I owe him something that I promised I would give him. That I promised the Lord, if he got me out of this, if he made a way over there, if he handled this issue, if he worked this thing out, that I would give him something that I owe him. Well, what does he owe him? In the last verse, verse 17, the psalmist says, the vow I'm going to give, what I'm going to render is the sacrifice of thanksgiving. That I'm going to give him thanks for what he's done. I'm going to say thank you for answering my prayer. Thank you for going above my petition. Thank you for being patient with me. Thank you for protecting me. But the psalmist calls it a sacrifice. How can thanksgiving be a sacrifice? Here it is. Because sometimes giving thanks is not easy to do. You can have so much going on and going wrong that when you get to the house of God, giving thanks is not at the top of your agenda. I mean, can we be real? Life can get so rough, you come in here with problems, questions, frustrations. And let me tell you how I know when giving thanks is a sacrifice. Because when people encourage you to praise God, it aggravates you. No, I'm not going to touch my neighbor and say nothing. You ever been there? When Theron was directing VOT, 
took the mic, said, come on, saints, praise the Lord, and you want to look at her with that evil eye? And I ain't getting up doing nothing. I didn't come here to shout today. I didn't come here to give thanks today. I didn't come here to lift up hands today. You know you've been there. When you sit next to that wrong neighbor, you know sister shout a lot. You, you know her. That's why you come to 11, because she come to 8. I don't want to be next to somebody going to be standing up and hollering and shouting all the time, sit down. I'm not in that mood today. You've been there when giving thanks is not easy to do. When somebody leading the praise and worship, come on, bless the Lord, saints, put your hand, shut up! Because it's not easy to give thanks. Now, I want you to know I understand because I've been there. I don't like being here every Sunday either. I'm like you, I want to stay at home every now and then. I was raised in an old school church, some old school parents. I keep telling y'all my parents are old school. Let me tell you how I know my parents are old school. Because we went to church. Every Sunday. How, how do you sign error? Error. <laughs> we went to church every Sunday. <laughs> my, my parents didn't care how late you stayed up on Sunday, on Saturday, because we went to church every Sunday. Yo, I had friends who wouldn't come sleep over at my house because they knew if you woke up in my house on Sunday, they don't care whether your mama took you to church or not, you were going to church with us because we go to church every Sunday. And, and one Sunday, my mama got me up to take me to church and I had an attitude that gun because it was the first Sunday of summer. And school was out. And what I couldn't understand is, if you didn't have to go to school in the summer, <laughs> why do I have to go to church in the summer? So I'm in the church with an attitude. And as we did every week, when we got to the church, mama would take us upstairs to see the pastor. It was an old school church. His name was Dr. L.R. Jackson. Now, you know it's old school when the pastor went by two first initials. <laughs> y'all, y'all. We would see L.R. Jackson. And Dr. Jackson, every Sunday, he wanted to see the kids because he kept a pocket full of candy. And on Sundays, when you come see L.R. Jackson, he'd reach in his pocket and hand you some candy. And so mama, with me with a bad attitude, took me to L.R. Jackson's office. He reached in his pocket, gave me some candy. I took it and walked out. My mama grabbed me outside of the office and said, boy, don't you ever embarrass me like that. Says Rose, she grabbed me by my ear and dragged me back into the pastor's office and said, what do you say? The pastor gave you candy. What do you say? I didn't know what she meant and she squeezed my ear harder. I said, thank you for my candy. And she let my ear go. I want to talk to somebody who came to church with a little bad attitude this morning. You didn't come in here to give God thanks, I know. But let me grab your ear and drag you into the presence of God and remind you that the Lord has made a way. And what are you supposed to say? The Lord has answered your prayers. What are you supposed to say? The Lord has made a way out of no way. What are you supposed to say? The Lord has healed your body. What are you supposed to say?
supposed to say? The Lord provided for your needs. What are you supposed to say? Thank you for every blessing. Thank you for every brand new day. Thank you for every way you made. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Hey. Somebody holler, thank you. May the Lord bless you mighty good. But the psalmist cried out that I'm going to thank him right now. That whenever I think of the goodness of God, right now, I bless him. It may not be shouting time, but when I think of his goodness, right now, I bless him. Hey! 